like to welcome everybody to uh, this is the second part in a two-part uh, series on terracotta. Uh, we had in, last in 2013 given a webinar on fabrication methods of terracotta. Uh, this is part two and it's the evaluation of terracotta cladding systems. A lot of it will be redundant or some of it will be redundant to our sort of typical evaluations of facades but there are some unique features involved in terracotta. Um, presenting it is myself, Ed Gerns, um, and Matt Nabeski. We are both from the Chicago office and have a fair amount of experience working with terracotta. So with that, I will proceed. A brief outline of what we're going to be talking about today, uh, covering a bit of the history and background of terracotta and its uses pretty much over the last 500 years or so. The general diagnostic process of evaluating facades with emphasis and specific criteria related to terracotta itself. Part of that will be reviewing installation details, some of the mechanisms of deterioration and distress that are observed in terracotta facades. Uh, in a more global sense, systemic patterns and things to look out for with a little bit of uh, case study. Uh, stuff thrown in there to, to illustrate that. And then some testing and evaluation, potential things that could be considered in the process of evaluating facades. Brief history and background of terracotta. It's been around for several centuries. Its use has evolved and morphed significantly over that time period. If we look at it in a general sense, and this is a little bit redundant to what we talked about during the fabrication process, but just to back up a little bit for those who may have missed it. Uh, terracotta literally translated as baked earth or burnt clay. It's a ceramic material used for architectural purposes since ancient times. Uh, it began to gain more popularity um, around the 15th, 14th, and 15th century in Western Europe, uh, particularly in Northern Italy, and then began much more in earnest in England beginning in the early 19th century to help um, and embellish brick buildings of that time period. As far as terracotta's development and evolution in the United States, pretty much began about the mid 18th century or mid 1800s, 1850 to 1890. Some of the early manufacturers uh, were brought in. The, the issue of terracotta initially was that it was essentially a, a more economical alternative to the more traditional carved stone. And as a result, uh, particularly in New York, there was some resistance for the use of the material by the cutters or the stone cutters in New York City. Certainly uh, in Chicago there was a big uh, increase in the use of terracotta particularly after the 1871 fire where it began to be used as a fireproofing material um, in parallel and in concert sometimes with stone and cast iron as being potential fire resistant or fireproof material. And then also the development or implementation of it in terms of some structural aspects both in terms of walls as well as floor systems, clay tile arches, um, as um, in archaic floor systems. And then as a fireproofing material as well, as I'd mentioned. Continuing on through that evolution, 1890 to about 1930, uh, terracotta began to be used as an ornament uh, to accentuate uh, building facades and or part of the entire uh, curtain wall system itself. It um, had an advantage over stone in that you could produce multiple pieces using single, a single model and mold in order to produce them. Uh, so it became a more economical alternative to stone. Initially, it was used as sort of a mimicking uh, device for brownstone and other stones because the glazes and finishes could be made to look like those stones. It was different than stone, though, in terms of how it was anchored, and we'll get into that. Um, but it, they also weighed less, the, the units themselves weighed less than stone because they were hollow. And there was also the introduction of a new sort of ability to use it as an ornamental system. One of the big advantages of terracotta was the weight and the speed of construction and that buildings could be built much more quickly uh, in terms of hanging the system using the curtain wall um, approach where the, the cladding system was hung from the structural frame rather than being integral specifically to the structural frame. And then probably the, the apex of this, although it was not near the end of its use, was the Woolworth building, a terracotta-clad 
high-rise building in New York City, 57 stories tall, uh, certainly the tallest terracotta building um, that had been constructed. So that was sort of the, the apex of the use of that. Bear with me. Uh, there we go. Uh, a couple of examples, the one that I breezed through there fairly quickly. This is the idea of terracotta being used to help mimic stone and some of the ornament that can be associated with it. So fairly straightforward color as far as, uh, again, the idea of mimicking this material to look like stone. One of the other things that was talked about and extolled by the terracotta manufacturers was this notion of the material being self-cleaning. You had the highly vitrified finishes on the material that enabled dirt or didn't allow dirt to really accumulate on the surface of the material itself. By the late 1920s and the rise of Art Deco, it was beginning to be used or was being used as an, as an architectural expression in and of itself with the polychrome glazes that were possible and all these sorts of great expressions that could be used. So that's the, uh, the background in a nutshell. So in terms of facade assessments, uh, certainly if you've been at WGA for any length of time, you've dealt with the assessments of things and how we do them. I'll breeze through this fairly quickly because a lot of this should be fairly redundant in terms of the general approach, in terms of the history and background or review of a, a um, facade assessment, looking at original documents that may be available, past repairs that have been performed, um, the precedence of what's been done before, um, and also in terms of resources, some of the period sources that exist in terms of understanding how these systems go together. The thing about terracotta clad buildings in particular is they are kind of in a period of transition in the facade uh, sequence of things in that they are more of a hybrid system, something combining the traditional load bearing system with a much more modern type of curtain wall system, the glass and metal curtain walls, and it's sort of a hybrid system between those two. Uh, then in terms of a visual assessment, looking at it from a macro level, looking for global patterns and distress associated with orientation and that sort of thing. Continuing on is the idea of looking at it in a micro or close up inspection, uh, looking for representative conditions, focusing on the corners. Again, this stuff is not unique necessarily to terracotta, um, and it's done on most of what we do. And then certainly a very important thing, and we'll get into this in a bit more detail, is the idea of inspection openings, or as our East Coast friends like to call them, probes, looking at that in both distressed locations as well as undistressed locations. And then some testing issues, or testing potential things that could be done both in the lab and in the field. So here's some examples of assessment, whether it's visual, using rope access, hands-on inspections of these things. So different levels of getting to look at these buildings at, or facades themselves at a closer level. Access becomes important, how that's done, whether it's using rope access, a crane, swing stage, pipe scaffolding, mass climbers, personnel lifts, all of these things are potential things and certainly equipment that is used by WJE on a regular basis to look at these things. As I mentioned, one of the most important things, particularly in, in terracotta evaluations, is the idea of inspection openings, of looking at what's, what's occurring behind the material itself. We've had limited success, and I'll touch on this briefly toward the end, using things like boroscopes. Uh, there are some tricky issues with terracotta that have to be considered. Likewise, testing, both field and laboratory testing, different things that can be done, we'll touch on that ever so briefly. So when the assessment is done, then there's the evaluation of that, that information that's been gathered, the synthesis, synthesis of the information, prioritization, what needs to be done based on finances or any other criteria that may exist, what approach is being used for the restoration or repair of the facade itself, and then if phasing is something that might be necessary. So in terms of the, the overall view of how we assess facades, that was what was covered previously, but what is it that makes terracotta different? Really what it comes down to, in a sense, is some of the installation details. What I'm going to flip through here in the next few slides are some examples of detailing of how different components of buildings are supported and what it is that makes terracotta unique in terms of the armature and anchorage system that goes into supporting this component, which in many ways is, is somewhat similar to stone, but there are significant differences. So 
what you see here are some early examples of detailing that comes out of some period sources from around the turn of the last century. And you can see the idea, this issue of a hybrid wall system where the terracotta is in some instances more integral to the backup masonry wall system and in other instances it's treated more as a pure cladding element um, to reduce weight and keep the cladding system or keep the outside white, if you will, acting independently of the interior white. So there's different ways that that's being shown. A couple of more examples of cornices in this particular instance. Due to some lessons that were learned in terms of some of the early problems with some of the detailing, the detailing evolved pretty much from the 1890s until about 1930 when the use of terracotta virtually came to a standstill. Here you see some of the more uh, refined detailing that existed by the late 1920s in terms of understanding and having the system behave somewhat independently of the backup wall and that it was being treated as a different material than say its stone counterparts and the idea of hanging these pieces and supporting them using what ends up being a fairly complex assemblage of steel uh, armatures and clips and, and hooks and, and those sorts of things. A few more examples here. These are some examples just where some units have been taken off in terms of inspection opening. The, the purpose here really is to show this idea of, of the steel behind here. So the cladding sits up in here and then the different methods that are used to support the cladding all essentially coming back to these steel substrate elements and what's being done with them. A couple more examples of some J-hooks, actual in-situ J-hooks and different hanging mechanisms that are used. The photograph on the left is one that's already been cleaned and painted. The one on the right was from an inspection opening to verify the condition of the steel behind it. But what you're seeing here is essentially hung lentils and two different methods that are being used to hang the lentils based on where the steel is behind it. At this point, Matt is available to be able to take this, us through this part of the presentation to talk about some mechanisms of deterioration. There are several sources of deterioration or distress um, that terracotta can experience, somewhat like other uh, clay products, brick. Uh, moisture, thermal, uh, building movement due to gravity, differential set of, uh, settlement of the building, depending on how it's situated on the site. Wind loads, natural movement of the building, um, movement from earthquake. How the material properties in themselves work, uh, how the systems are designed, and then uh, workmanship, how things are installed, how things are anchored, whether things are backfilled or not properly, and how things just go into the, the wall system itself. Deterioration due to water, <clears throat> uh, as similar to a brick as well, it has freeze-thaw, because it's a clay material, clay body. And then because it's supported by steel, you can have corrosion of steel and you can get uh, loss of section, as is shown in the upper right-hand photograph, or you can get distress on the terracotta units due to accumulation of scale from the rust, uh, corrosion of the rust, and uh, rust tracking, as shown in the tall picture. And then the angle itself is shown in the uh, bottom right-hand corner with, with a lot of scale on that angle. Other types of deterioration can be from movement itself, unaccommodated expansion, um, not having expansion joints, terracotta wants to grow just like um, brick does. Stacking effects, if it's not supported, if there's areas not supported by shelf angles or shelf angles every other floor, you can get stacking effects and the sheer weight of one unit stacked on top of another one can cause distress. Building movements, again, kind of talked about that before. Um, from, but you can get different types of building movements, such as uh, trinkets of the frame. If you have a concrete frame and you have the terracotta on the outside, the concrete frame is going to want to shrink and the terracotta is going to want to grow, so you can get creep. And depending upon load pass, load pass around windows, opening, punches, um, water tables, any kind of change in the elevation, you can get deterioration from that. Material properties, I'll just go through some of these, but you can read it as well. We have deterioration due to the strength of the material, depending upon the hardness of the, the material, um, the workability, porosity of the, the clay, or the, also the, the glazed body of the terracotta, thermal conductivity, and then the physical structure. 
Other types of deterioration that you can see might be due to workmanship, orientation, how things are installed in the wall. Uh, that also goes into configuration, how things are laid up, how um, it goes back to the, to the structure. Uh, manufacturing issues. The manufacturer has an issue with uh, uh, developing the terracotta. There could be uh, deterioration due to that. Preparation before things go on the wall. And then, obviously, installation. Um, like I said before, how things are hung, how things are installed uh, can all cause uh, issues with deterioration or distress. The distress mechanisms, uh, the manifestations that we usually see in terracotta, again, very similar to what you see in masonry walls, deterioration of joints, uh, spalling, both deep and shallow, visible cracking on the outside, in-plane cracking, which is always the harder of the ones to see, cracking within the wall that's parallel with the face that you can't see and you might be able to pick up with sounding, crazing, Displacements of the units, and then ultimately what nobody wants to see is, is failure. Just a quick little chart. I think we all know corrosion and what causes corrosion, the corrosion process itself. So there's just a little bit explanation of it. But the more important graph here is the stress due to corrosion um, of the steel and loss of its protection. Um, usually here is something that gives kind of like a guideline or steel itself. First 30 years, steel has some protective nature to it, has little corrosion. Uh, between 30 and 60, you start to see corrosion of the steel and therefore distress of the units. And then beyond 60, you can start to see significant distress and failures. Um, it's usually, you can see in, in a lot of buildings in, in big metropolises, about in about 50 years after being built is the time frame when a lot of cornices and stuff started to come down because nobody wanted to maintain them and they saw a lot of the stress from the steel. So as we continue to talk about steel, like I said before, the two types, you can have accumulation of scale. Um, top left-hand photo shows um, the buildup of, of corrosion scale. Bottom left-hand photo shows show the same thing, kind of close up. And scale can uh, accommodate um, four to 12 times the size of the original, original thickness of the piece. So it can grow quite a bit, causing a lot of distress in the units, as you can imagine. Can also have a loss of section in angles and plates, as is shown in the picture on the right. And of course, once you lose loss of section, you're going to lose support and have things fail. There are telltale signs of some corrosion issues, as shown in these pictures: horizontal cracks along the tops of balusters, sills, which is a left-hand photo, as well as lintels on the right-hand photos, can be a telltale sign of corrosion of the embedded horizontal rods or depending upon if there's a, you know, if it's, if it's supported off an angle as a lintel sometimes is rather than being hung, it can be a, a telltale, telltale sign of corrosion and cracking distress in the unit. Other cracking which is, is harder to detect uh, is in-plane cracking. The left hand picture is a, is a section, is a, is a side view of a terracotta unit. You can see that the angle and the corrosion from the angle caused the in-plane cracking of that ashlar panel. Um, it's not something you'd be able to see visually from the outside. Uh, you may be able to pick these up when you sound them and that's something that you're looking for, but you also need to know unit, are units supposed to be hollow and not backfilled? Are they going to be backfilled? Uh, there's things like that that make it somewhat difficult sometimes to detect these things and the best way is making periodic inspection openings. The picture on the right hand side, again, the anchor is a, it's a view looking down from the top. You can tell that the anchor is corroded and they're no longer grabbing the unit laterally at the top right hand, left hand corner of that unit. But it's also caused a crack, again, in plane uh, that you wouldn't be able to see from the exterior face. Of course, you can get displacements and then that leads to failure, so that's something that's an easier thing to visually see. Other types of distress, you can get restrained compression is shown in this pier or mullion. The, Terracotta wanted to grow and got bound up by the lintels that come over and sit on top of it. And those are hung or notched lintels, but the, the jam wants to grow and, and binds up, has no place to go, and ends up cracking and spalling. It uh, can, can lead to continued cracking, as you can see by the arrows in the, in the picture on the left. The right, if you have a concrete frame building, like I said before, you have the concrete wants to shrink and the terracotta wants to expand, so you can get restrained compression um, from that and it binding up and causing crack, cracking in the unit itself. Then there are times that you have mixed stresses. It's not always one thing that causes the failure or one thing that causes the uh, 
the units to crack, such as shown in these pictures at the bottom of a pier column and at the corner of the lintel unit is shown in the right, you can have stresses from um, changing, like I said, in the openings. You can, have, you can have corrosion of underlying steel. It's not always clear exactly if there's one thing causing the stress or if it's multiple conditions. Here again, another pier, but this time it's kind of punched through and caused a stress in the underside of the lintel because the pier is recessed from the lintel itself. So you can see the cracking on the underside of the soffit area, lintel area. And on the top right hand photo, you can see cracking on the side of the pier. So sometimes it's just that compression just cracks the pier or causes it to go into the lintel. And there are sometimes other outstanding issues that cause distress on terracotta. For example, upper left hand corner, you can see railings. Uh, these railings bear directly on the terracotta. So it put undue distress on the terracotta and the way that it was um, designed and installed. You can see that there is a protruding wash course unit and then there is a ashlar lintel, decorative ashlar lintel unit there. But that lintel is notched out as you can see in the bottom right hand photo and also in the detail to the left there. So by notching it out you cause weak places, weak spots for um, stresses to build up and you can see in the, that bottom left hand photograph cracking that goes through the unit right from its support, all due to the weight of the weight railing on top. Other things, uh, corners of the buildings are notorious for not having steel continue around the corner and provide full support. So again, you can get issues with movement at corners due to not being supported which can also turn into stacking effects. You can also get corrosion on the angle, which will cause distress. So all things that can happen um, are, are shown in this photograph. Top left-hand corner, cracking in plane again, something that you may not be able to see visually from the outside. Um, picture in the middle is after we've cleaned and painted the steel. Um, and then picture on the right kind of shows, picture on the bottom left shows the location of where the, the shelf angles were located. Again, more pictures of just distress, jams of units, uh, lintels are often prone, especially when the lintel itself uh, goes into the masonry wall and isn't separated from the jam or the pier units itself, often signs of uh, distress in areas of location. Other locations of distress that are hard to visually see, if, if the lintel units are hung, as it is shown in, in the case of the photograph to the top left, you've got a angle here above the hung terracotta lintel, which are hung by the J bolts and a horizontal rod, which is shown in the right photograph. The corrosion on the underside of the angle pushed down on the lintel, causing the web within the units to actually crack, which you can't see visually on the outside, uh, which you're actually losing the support that's hanging the unit so the, the unit can, you can use the unit and the unit can fall. Another example of lintel conditions, decorative ones here with keystones in the middle. Uh, two bottom photographs show how they were installed and often during installation contractors will modify units as they need to install it and you can see looking here the webs themselves were notched around so it's really not bearing or supporting onto the angle itself. So those are conditions that can occur too that can cause stresses and distress in the terracotta units. More distress is displacement. Uh, corner of buildings is often prone to displacement from thermal and, and movement of the, of the terracotta units, expansion of the units. Here's one showing the corner of a uh, cornice. The thermal movement of the units caused the corner to fail and fall. You can see in the top right hand photograph at least it's a uh, Ended up on a, on a lower roof, took out the HVAC system, but didn't go all the way to the, to the ground. Other photographs showing conditions at these corners, which are often the more pronounced locations for, for distress, because you're seeing a lot of movement at the corners and unrestrained um, from either side, so it's often a location for some distress to form. And depending upon how things are constructed, um, often sometimes there are non-corroded materials used to hang or support units as anchors, uh, such as shown in these pictures by the grayish um, copper alloy. Uh, 
anchors, uh, the, the hooks and the dowels that are used to support units. However, they all go back to various metal uh, beams or angles or some kind of structural support, and those are prone to the corrosion and the stress in the unit themselves. Plintos, because they are hung, they are often prone to be, when you do a visual inspection, you might see that they have some displacement, especially in the center. Um, there are units that are installed with a horizontal rod, and they were tweaked and torqued during installation by the J-hooks um, to get them into place. You've got the mortar between the units also helping often hold them into place. That You might see sagging, uh, dipping, um, in a, a little bit in and out of movement of the, of the lintels themselves, uh, just due to uh, the actual construction of lintels. Crazing is another type of distress that you'll see in the glazing of the body of the unit. Um, and it's in the glazing portion, as shown in this right-hand photograph, can be due to stress and also can be due to production of the unit. This picture, left-hand side, uh, it's a good indication that there's some stresses going on at the corner at the top of that pier. You can see where somebody previously put a little mortar to, to fill up a, a little spall, but you can see from the crazing in the in the units the, the kind of stress that's that's occurring at that where that lintel sits on that uh, lintel sits on that jam unit. Other conditions that cause stress are the way that things are supported. How much of the terracotta unit is bearing on the structure? How is it being held into place? A uh, good example is a picture on the right-hand side. The unit was notched out either in the manufacturer or by the contractor on site. And you can see that there's a minimal bearing back on the angle itself, so it causes a weak, uh, a weak spot, a place for the terracotta to crack. You can see by the finger where the horizontal crack is occurring that runs through the base of the unit as well. And in the background, you can see the, the, the size and the weight of the units above that also projecting that are causing those units to crack just by the bearing of the units, units above it and the, the unit not being fully supported and having a notch out. Other things that happen, again, contractors modify, make modifications in the field. You get a panel, as shown in the left hand, that the back is cut off in order to fit around a spandrel beam, the angle at the bottom. So it makes the unit thinner. Uh, depending upon if it's taking a loan from above, it's conceived stress from that, or how is it going to be anchored as well. You can see that the anchor hole, um, this anchor hole isn't being used, but if you were using that anchor hole, uh, had minimal support, minimal material behind it to keep it into place. Picture on the right, you can see the terracotta was removed, and it's next to the brick now, but you can see where the, the angle is to support that terracotta lintel and the, the minimal distance it has from the face of the brick, thus the face of the terracotta that would probably be notched out to fit around that type of angle. More pictures of modifications in the field, um, same things we've been talking about here with these units showing the stress because of the notching occurring and the steel placement behind the unit. Then there is the stress of spalling. There's three types of spalling, deep spalls, shallow spalls or face spalls, chips, and then glaze spalls. Deep spalls are due to corrosion. Um, spalls can also be due to freeze thaw damage. Uh, issues with the glazing can be d due to differential expansion of the glazing versus the body, uh, known as glaze fit. Organic growth can get behind it and pop off the the glaze. You can have impact to the unit itself that can cause damage in spalls. As I said before, deep spalls due to embedded corrosion and um, then that the rusting and the corrosion scale is shown in these two photographs. And there can be glaze spalling, um, portions of the, the face of the body um, spalling off, taking the glazing with it, or just the glazing spalling, as I said before, due to glaze fit and ex different expansion between the glaze and the actual the body of the, the unit. The picture with the arrow on the bottom is showing some organic growth behind the unit that's caused the, the, the glaze spall. Other issues is evaluation of the substrate. Um, if you get on a building and you see distressed units, you may not go into a full repair program. You may need to stabilize something either with pins or straps. Um, so you need to know where the steel is because you don't want to go and just in an Ashley unit back thinking you're getting it into brick, mas brick masonry backup when you're actually hitting uh, 
a steel beam behind and your pins aren't going to actually do anything for you. Uh, you can also have a poor backup as, sh as shown in this picture to the right where the contractors during original construction obviously didn't fill uh, those areas solid. So you get voids and your pins don't do any good as well. So even if you're not doing a full repair program and you, you need to stabilize units, it's good to know what kind of backup you have um, and where the steel is located. And ultimately when you go to do repair detailing, you're going to want to know all these conditions because you're going to want to know how you're going to support and anchor your new units back to something sound. Now I'm going to turn it back to Ed for talk about systematic patterns. Okay. So as Matt mentioned, the next thing we're going to talk about, he's dealt with some of the localized components and distress that can be observed in terracotta units. But one thing that also has to be considered is, is there a potential for a systemic issue existing on the building? Uh, the first case study is kind of a classic example of that where the white material that has the red dash box around it is terracotta and the other areas of the building are brick and the there are shelf angles with each intermittent floor and the terracotta is essentially stacked up over the full height of this building without expansion joints. We should note that certainly during this time period the use of expansion joints was very limited uh, in, in terms of their incorporation into buildings of this type. This is a construction photograph while the building was originally under construction, just based on the cars in the picture at the bottom. But this is some of the kinds of distress that we were seeing on this particular building, which are fairly indicative of a stacking effect where you can read pretty directly where the shelf angles are located. And in this particular instance, what we're getting is localized spalling or spalling at these locations over a period of years. So the distress in this particular instance manifested itself as spalling. We've also seen it in terms of vertical cracking and different types of distress related to that. But what it really comes down to is this idea of all the stresses flowing through uh, the entire height of this terracotta stack and essentially no relief. The drawing on the right is a sketch of what the system looks like where the backup is pretty intricately uh, tied into the units themselves going up and down and then with the intermediate support at each floor. This is another example of a building and what you'll see here with the red dashed highlights is the floor, the third floor from the top, all of the window openings have arched uh, openings over the top of them. And when we were looking at this building, here's the elevation of it, what you can see. But when we started looking into this building a little bit more, then arch being a fairly stiff element in terms of uh, compression and, and the how the load flows through it, um, it's a pretty rigid and stiff element. So we have a projecting cornice or water table over the top of it, the usual assemblage of steel supporting those components. But really what ended up happening on this was that the combination, going back to one of the slides Matt had shown, is you've got ashlar units over the top of the arch, which you can see the segment of the arch in the lower right-hand corner of the photograph. The units themselves were notched around the uh, bottom flange of this beam and with the overturning effect of the water table above it as well as the load coming down from the floors above it, there was a stress concentration that was created at this inside notch area and the arrow on the left shows a pretty systemic, not a pretty systemic, a pretty consistent crack that was observed throughout that floor of this building. So. This idea of looking at these things from a more global perspective in terms of some of the distress that may exist. There we go. Uh, this is the same building at the top. It's a fairly traditional cornice. You see the section drawing on the right, which shows the steel and the various components. And a lot of times what happens with these cornices based on the geometry and where the center of gravity of things are, there tends to be a natural rotation that wants to occur in the mass of the units, uh, thinking of them as behaving more monolithically. The arrow in the lower left-hand corner shows a crack that was evident, and that was more of a local issue where the, there was corrosion of that top flange of that channel that you can see in the upper left-hand corner, and that resulted in that crack that carried through. But the other thing that sometimes happens with these buildings that's better illustrated with this photograph, which has a similar type of water table 
uh, and parapet configuration is that mass of masonry that's outboard of the major point of support and the load flow results in a rotational moment being imparted on this particular building component. And what usually ends up taking the brunt of that rotation are these brackets, which certainly to some extent have some structural uh, role in the support, but generally are, are more thought of as a decorative component. And a lot of times what happens we had a slide earlier that showed that this was a, not this particular one, but often these brackets are, are hung and the amount of load that's supposed to get in them is really not intended to be that much. Incidentally, depending on how much um, maintenance is done or is done incorrectly, that for these brackets can get loaded up. And in this particular instance, there was a, a pretty consistent cracking that was occurring as a result of inadvertent load shifting onto these brackets throughout this area. So the last component, circling back to what I had initially talked to, talked about at the beginning in terms of assessment, was testing and evaluation that can be done. And the questions that really have to be asked, and they should be asked really with any type of investigation that's being done, is assuming we had a failure, depending on how you define that in terms of the scale, but why did the failure occur uh, based on the stress characteristics and patterns and certainly the investigation and assessment that we've gone into in some detail. So from a testing perspective, the question that comes up is, did the material properties contribute to this in any way? Is there a potential material compatibility issue that might exist? Now certainly this begins to overlap into the repair aspect of this, which we'll get into. I'll plug our third part of this webinar at this point as well or previous repairs that may be contributing to some of the problems that have occurred. So breaking down the testing into field testing and lab testing, when you talk about field testing specific to terracotta facades, there's really four things that, are, that can be considered, and I'll, I'll use that with a little bit of caution, and you'll see why here in a second. Uh, strain relief testing is certainly something that has been done. It's been done by WJE dating back to the 1970s on the um, Woolworth Building in New York City. There was a lot of work done and a lot published on that. And we continue to do that from uh, depending on the project. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, the use of a metal detector, infrared, therm infrared thermography. And then one of the most basic things that we do in a lot of building evaluations is sounding itself. So here you see the process of the strain relief testing. This is an all terracotta building. There was distress that was consistent with stacking, uh, similar to what I showed in case one. Um, in this particular building, the crack, the distress is more manifest in terms of vertical cracking, but the idea of, of putting strain gauges on the building, then cutting the piece loose below a support point in order to measure the amount of distress that goes into that. Um, going back a little bit, we've done that. It's been done for years. A lot of times the uh, results can be a little bit confusing. Uh, you'd see lots of evidence of what would appear to be strain, uh, stress related uh, or distress related to stacking, uh, yet the readings that come back when we do this are relatively low, and it's, so it's a little bit surprising. Uh, don't want to divest, diverge too, too much, but when they did the testing at the Woolworth building in the 70s, they got huge stresses in the building which were consistent with what the distress was. Um, that unfortunately has not always been the case when we've done this in the past. So how much validity you put in that you have to be careful with. The use of a metal detector. Um, Mike was of course quick to point this out to me is that I'm using a metal detector on a stone clad building which in and of itself points to the fact that there's a lot of steel in these walls. Where they are and what they're doing it can be difficult to detect. So the use of a metal detector may or may not provide any information. Uh, there may be steel in there, who knows what it is, because oftentimes with these systems, there's a lot of steel that's used to support it. Similar, similarly, with the infrared thermography, what is the value of this? Is there any value of this? I know certain people put a lot of stock in the information that could be potentially provided by these. If it's valuable or not valuable, that's largely um, takes some discretion to decide. And then even starting to think about it in terms of sounding, uh, it's the sounding of terracotta buildings is not like sounding a concrete building. The, the cause and effect is not always quite as obvious in terms of there being problems. Uh, and a lot of times on with some of our competitors, this is misused. They'll sound units 
which were meant to be hollow and are hollow, and they'll think that's a problem it's because they're not filled. So, or they're partially filled, which is something else that happens very frequently in terracotta facades. So there needs to be a lot of caution in terms of what is being actually determined by the sounding process when you're doing it in the field. So of those four things that we discussed, it really comes down to what is the information that you've gathered mean in terms of what's going on with the building. And the need to be fairly careful about what it is that you're concluding based on the, the, the field testing that's performed. So the next facet of this is the idea of laboratory testing or is laboratory testing. In terms of a terracotta clad building system, the potential things that could be tested are the mortar, the terracotta, and maybe in some instances the underlying steel or the concrete. Uh, the, the usual reasons for testing the uh, concrete are deleterious materials. If it's applicable, not that you can really do a whole lot with that because the structure is what it's going to be at that point. There's not much you can do to address problems that may exist in the concrete. In terms of the steel, usually the issue is weldability. Um, if that is playing a part in the repair process, uh, how weldable is the steel? Is the steel weldable? And what special procedures might be necessary? Uh, mortar, that's fairly straightforward and fairly basic. Uh, it's the same thing that applies in terms of the uh, brick masonry type of testing that's done with mortar and the, the issues associated with that. The last thing, and I, I took these a little bit out of order, is the terracotta. And the important thing to really note in terms of architectural terracotta is that there are actually no specific standards that exist for terracotta itself in terms of ASTM standards. Uh, one of the things we're doing as part of the masonry TRD is an in-house research project to begin to try and look at that in a little bit more detail. Often what happens now is not often what happens. What happens now is a lot of the standards are borrowed from the brick in or the brick industry and some of the tests that they use, or even the concrete industry in some instances. And there's a real need to sort of look at that as a material in and of itself and develop tests that are specifically uh, focused on the terracotta itself. In terms of the laboratory testing, there can be physical testing and chemical testing. So this is. I don't want to get into too much detail on all these, but you have some things, and, and some of these tests have actually been developed uh, a long time ago by Ross Martinek in terms of, of some of the issues with glaze and, and some of the other terracotta stuff. Uh, glaze permeability, glaze adhesion, glaze resistance, these are fairly standard tests in the industry uh, that are pretty straightforward. Uh, the issue is um, you, how, how they're used and how they're interpreted and getting them in a timely fashion exists Evaluating existing material is one thing, and I'm jumping the gun here a little bit in terms of evaluating new material. Uh, the compressive strength of the terracotta units themselves, shear strength, modulus of rupture, is that important? Is it necessary? Remember, this is primarily a cladding material, so the amount of load on it uh, generally should be fairly minimal in terms of conventional load flow, not necessarily inadvertent things. Uh, petrography can be run on these components, x-ray analysis and firing temperature, uh, determination of the firing temperature for those components. Free thaw cycling, that has more to do or that has to do with durability of the material, moisture expansion, coefficient of thermal expansion, and the propensity or potential for efflorescence to develop. Also, initial rate of absorption and saturation coefficients. Certainly, freeze thaw cycling and saturation coefficients are two of the most important tests in terms of the relative durability of the material. But it's important to understand that you're dealing with an existing material, not a new material. So, how much of this testing needs to be done has to be thought about in those terms. Some other um, things include fading, abrasion resistance, and imperviousness. So, some of these tests apply mostly to uh, new material. So with that, I think we're going to open it up to uh, questions if anybody has them. And before we get on to any questions, I'm going to put in the last plug for stay tuned for part three of this uh, coming potentially within the next year or so on the repair of terracotta. So with that, I'll switch it back. And if there are any questions, feel free to submit them. See, if you have any questions to get us started with. Um, the first one here says, how often do you actually do you actually do field and or lab testing during an assessment? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, 
you know, as, as I mentioned when I was going through that, it, a lot depends on the job itself and the kinds of distress that we're seeing. Uh, we, we we will tend to, uh, if we can, particularly on all all terracotta clad buildings, look at doing some strain relief. It's a relatively inexpensive test uh, to run, and it can sometimes give us some indication of what's going on. It's also given us some pretty kooky results too. So. Um, a lot of times it's it's really looking at things in terms of what's going on and what might be appropriate as opposed to just, let's say, throwing a whole bunch of money at laboratory testing that comes back with uh, some interesting information, but not necessarily anything that helps um, us decide what we should do or what needs to be done um, in, in terms of the existing material and what its properties are. All right, great. Um, the next question here says, can you speak to the current problem of glazed falls in new terracotta? <laughs> Go ahead, Ed. Uh, uh, yes, uh, that, uh, that actually is one of the things we're looking at in our in-house research uh, project that we're looking at. Uh, there is a, 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 a lot of information that's going out now, and if you're a member of the uh, Masonry TRG, um, issues uh, within the last year there's been sort of an all call of uh, anyone who's worked on a project where there's potentially problems with glaze falling uh, we've run into it on several projects uh, primarily in northern climates where the terracotta is experiencing premature glaze falling very quickly uh, some of the buildings that we're looking at it on there's a, a pretty clear correlation of cause and effect which uh, the material may be contributory to that, but the installation method uh, was likely a large, greater, uh, lar more significant contributor to the glaze falling developing. We think, off the record and um, not for public consumption, that there may be a problem with all three of the uh, manufacturer terracotta manufacturers in terms of their glaze. Um, whether that's the result of changes in the clay formulations because of a desire to increase the compression strength in the units or not, um, we're not sure. And that's really what the focus of the in-house research project is that we're um, pursuing at this point of getting existing material and getting historic material and then looking at it at a more in-depth level to try and figure out what it is that's going on and how big a problem is that actually um, going to be in the industry or has it been. All right. The next one here says, what is your typical approach to cleaning and protecting the steel supporting the terracotta? Your turn, Matt. Well, so it depends on, I mean, obviously cleaning, cleaning it to make sure that you have enough meat and don't have to do any repairs to it. But then we'll, we'll just use a, um, we'll just use a lot of times just to mimic 135 uh, to, to paint it. Um, if you, if it's a place where you want to put some flashing, to get some flashing, but never really put any, um, you know, not often that we put drips or anything coming out of terracotta facades. Um, so you can put some membrane flashing on it to give it added added protection, but mostly clean and paint, um, and then and then reinstallation of the terracotta units. All right, great. And um, there's still time if you have any other questions. We've got one last one that I see here. Um, it says, how do you know where steel is if you don't have original drawings and can't make inspection openings? So I'll take that one as well. Um, if, you're, if you're on a building doing an inspection and you can't make openings and you need to, like I said before in some of my slides, pin things back or do some kind of repairs, you know, there are some arch history, um, architectural uh, books that can give ideas of how uh, manufacturers wanted or gave architects ideas of how things should have been detailed and installed. So it could give you ideas of, of that as well. You can get also you also can get some ideas based upon the stress that you're seeing on the building, uh, looking down the line, trying to find out where shelf angles are, or at least where a toe of a angle or a plate might be, could be a good indication and in what kind of you know, what kind of distress you're seeing as well uh, might help with that indication. Some things um, to help out. Obviously, nothing's better than being able to remove a piece just to, to verify and, and, and document. And that might be something that you have to tell the unit, tell the building owner is, 
you know, you have issues and you can stabilize most of it, but you need to make some openings in order to verify where steel is or where sound backup masonry wall or the or the concrete frame is so that you can you can make sure that you support the the units in distress uh, properly. One thing I want to add to that is I think uh, what's really important is when we look at buildings that have distress, generally they, you know, it, particularly in older buildings, a lot of times it might be attributed and put sometimes incorrectly attributed to corrosion of the underlying steel. Uh, hopefully one of the takeaways from the presentation today is that distress in terracotta clad buildings often can result from not necessarily steel being corroded. And a lot of the distress may be consistent with corrosion of the steel, but it may just be the global building behavior and, and what's going on with that. So, you know, that again is why it's, it's significantly important to understand where there's steel and how much the steel is or where the steel is, but really what the condition of the steel is. Um, I know certainly on the, the projects we do, reserve studies and those sorts of things where you can't make openings, um, that becomes uh, something of a leap of faith that has to occur in terms of what you attribute the distress to. So just a word of caution. All right. Well, thanks again, um, Ed and Matt, and thank you to everyone who joined us today.